Are we on? It is not working. So it is not working. So it's all charbox. All right, sir. Okay, so we've had some fun yesterday in Shenzhen. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I mean, uh, if you go to Shenzhen, you can actually come in and say, we're going to give, you know, tablets to uh, <laughs> the entire audience. No, actually, um, we, we spotted quite a few interesting things. And if you go to Google+, you can uh, check out some of the stuff we found. So anyway, all right. So this is part three of the Embedded Android Workshop, talking today about the native Android workspace, which is essentially what the heck happens when I actually shell into the device and I try to do something with it, OK? So given that we've been very successful at keeping a very rapid speaking pace for the last two sessions, we will keep up with the same kind of pace today. <laughs> All right? We got about 45 minutes to go about through 40 slides and a couple of minutes to demo. And as you can see from the past two sessions, I'm actually pretty good at this. <laughs> All right, if you don't know me yet, just go watch the two other videos. It's just too late to know who I am. All right, uh, the native Android user space. What is in there? What does it do? Here's the file system layout. This is what you see when you shell into the device. Okay? There is a, um, a, each of these white boxes is a separate file system image or mount partition. Okay? I'm trying to make it simple. Really trying, doing my best. <laughs> so the RAM disk uh, has a bunch of directories and is relatively small. It's about like two megabytes or something like that. And it mounts a whole bunch of different other file systems, OK? Mainly, the two things it mounts is the data image and the system image. And I will walk you through these things uh, through the presentation, try to make them as simple as possible. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm using gingerbread just because it's simpler to follow. Jelly Bean just has a few, bunch of different additions to what I'm going to explain to you. And you should be able to follow that should you actually check it out for yourself. So we have the choices. Either go through slides, and you can read through these items, three of these slides. Or I could jump into a device and actually show you. <laughs> and I think the uh, latter is probably going to be more interesting. OK? So let me try to drop the mic a little bit here, uh, if I can remember how this works. I think we got it. All right. So here's the same device I had essentially from yesterday. All right, let's start the emulator. So as soon as this thing starts up, I'm going to be able to shell into it. Right about now should be a good time. All righty. So what do we got? All right, as I said, the older versions of Android um, do a <laughs> fantastic disservice to everybody by not listing the entries in an alphabetical order. But, you know, we're not going to let that stop us. So what do we have in here? Um, config, some configuration stuff. You can ignore that. Cache is for some of the uh, over-the-air upgrades and some of the caching that goes on the system. SD card is a symbolic link to where your actual SD card gets mounted. ACCTs for the control groups. Uh, the control groups in Android are used to ensure that uh, the foreground processes have a higher share of the CPUs. All right. Um, then you have MNT, the standard mount point, vendor, symbolic link to system vendor, D, Etsy, standard directory in Linux systems. All right. In this case, it's a symbolic link to system Etsy. I'll come back to this and its implications in a, uh, in a, in a few slides. Uevent.d.rc and uevent.d.goldfish.rc. What are those? So the way hot plug works in Linux is that the kernel sends events to user space when uh, new hardware gets plugged in. In classic Linux, the daemon that controls that is called udev. Okay? And there's a whole bunch of udev configuration scripts that you can use. In Android, the thing that takes care of that is uevent.d, and it has its own configuration files. They are relatively straightforward. In fact, let me show you here. It's essentially got one-liners with four entries, the entry and slash dev, the rights, the owner, and the group. That's about it. That's the only thing you can control in Android. 
if you're familiar with UDEV, you know that you can do a whole lot more than just this, okay? But U of ND can only do that, all right? So uh, what's the difference between .rc and .goldfish.rc? You'll see this pattern in a number of places where essentially there's like the core standard uh, file that comes from Android, and then there's the board specific file. In this case, Goldfish is the code name for the emulator. So these are the entries for the emulator. Your specific board might have something else, like you know, U of ND .crespo.rc or whatever it is that you have uh, on your system. System is the system directory. As I said, um, this is essentially where most of the Android firmware lives, and I'll dig into that directory separately in a separate conversation. Then you have sys, that's sysfs, same sysfs as in standard Linux. Sbin, the standard Sbin in Android doesn't really contain that much. All right, two things, it contains U of ND and ADBD. Uh, not really much in here. Um, all right, a, a proc, that's the same proc file system as in standard Linux. Init.rc, init.goldfish.rc. Now these, these are really important files here, okay? So the init process, as I said on uh, Monday, in Android is specific to Android and it's got its own configuration language and its own properties, its, its own specificities. And these are the files that are provided to configure it. Much like the U of ND variety, there is a global kind of standard one and there's one that's specific for the board, all right? Um, I will show you the semantics and the operation of this file separately, but just keep in mind that these files are really crucial to um, Android's behavior, and you know you kind of change those at your own risk, so to speak. Init, that's the actual binary, that's the actual init binary. Default.prop is one of the files that provides um, the set of global properties with which the init process will start. As I said uh, on Monday, init manages a global set of properties which you can access from anywhere in the system and which can be used to trigger events, okay? And I will show you um, also the property stuff uh, when I get to it a little bit later. Data is the data directory, which contains essentially all the runtime files that are created, databases for applications, and system information that kind of builds over time, all right? Whereas slash system is mounted as read only, slash data is usually mounted in a read write. Then you got root, which is typically empty, and then slash dev, which is the device uh, directory that contains all the device nodes for talking to actual devices. So far, so good. Can somebody point the distinction or the difference here or what's missing here between this and a standard Linux system? Slash Sorry? Slash temp. Yeah, sure, there's no slash temp. I mean, there's but more crucially, there's two other things which are missing here. Slash lib, slash bin, slash lib, slash user, yeah. But really crucially, slash bin and slash lib aren't here, okay? In any Unix system, in Linux system, these things are crucial. And the fact that they're not here is actually a good thing, because I'll show you a trick at the end of this presentation, which allows me to take a glibc based stack and just shove it in here without any conflict whatsoever. You had a question, sir? Yeah. Um, my question is create a temporary files. D property files. Yeah, yes. It's a temporary file under the slash temp and it's full of this stuff on the it's actually a single temporary file and Oh, why don't? Why isn't there any slash temp uh, in Android? I don't think there's anything that precludes you from actually creating slash temp and putting temporary files inside of it if you really wanted to. Um, it's just not part of the default distribution. I mean, that's not how the default distribution operates. But that, there's nothing that I know of that kind of precludes you from doing that. And we maybe we can talk about it a little bit later in more detail if you want. All right. Okay. So that's for the top level. Now, if you dig in. One level down, and let's just start with slash system here, okay? What do we got in here? Okay, Etsy. So Etsy here has got a bunch of configuration files, much like slash Etsy would, all right? Then you got framework. This one's pretty cool, because this has all the jars 
which essentially are the compiled Java parts of the system, whether it be the system services or the framework that applications are talking to, this is where you'll find this stuff. There's also a um, framework res.apk. These are the default uh, resources for the entire framework. Okay? What do we got else in here? Lib. These are the libraries that get compiled in Android. So if I check this guy out, I find all the SOs that are useful for my system. Most importantly, if you check in lib slash hw, these are the HAL modules which we were talking about earlier this week that provide hardware support. All right, there's also a lib um, EGL, oops, no tabs here, eh? Which has the GL stuff. All right, so that's for your system lib. What do we got else? Uh, we got um, system user. This is kind of like a slash user directory that you have in standard Linux, but you know, it just doesn't have that much stuff inside of it. There's app. These are the factory applications. Okay, so if I check in um, app, what do we got? We have all the APKs that got built as part of the standard um, AOSP. Right? These are the things you can't remove from the device. So the crapware you get on the phones, <laughs> that's where it is. Well, no, actually, so I've created myself a folder on my phone, and I kind of dragged and dropped all of them in there. <laughs> all righty, back to serious stuff. Bin, these are all the native binaries that run in Android, okay? And that includes the toolbox utility that is kind of like a replacement for BusyBox. But anything that runs on the shell kind of is in here, so, so to speak. All righty, uh, funds, self-explanatory. Uh, XBIN are extra binaries, which are not necessarily crucial to the operation of the system. You could kind of get rid of this thing. It's got strace, it's got um, SQLite 3, which is a command line tool to talk to SQLite um, databases. Build prop is a set of default properties, and I'll talk about the properties kind of separately here, okay? So that's when, what's in slash system. If you look inside slash data, what do we got? Okay, don't panic. <laughs> it's probably kind of a message from the guy that created this. So this is essentially where the dump from uh, a kernel crash would find itself uh, when you would restart the system, all right? Uh, forget about MISC for a second. Local is, interestingly, world writable on all devices. You get yourself a phone from any handset manufacturer, and you can actually shove stuff in there, whatever you want. It, you can write it. App private versus app, what is that? When you install an application on an Android device, it used to go in data app. Okay, that's where the APKs that you would get off the market would go. There was an option in the, um, in the uh, developer store that allowed you to say, I don't want the actual user to be able to take the APK off of the device, and in that case, it would go in data private. Um, I'm told that this is somewhat deprecated, and that the new way of doing things is essentially to use the standard uh, licensing API that's now been made available to app developers, where the app developer can check whether or not his version he's actually running is the legit version. So that kind of is somewhat less uh, relevant. Uh, but still, you know, the APKs would go in here, and it's data something. Secure is for when stuff is mounted in um, uh, 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 using encryption. Then you have data data. That one's very interesting because data data is essentially where, um, sorry, again, one more. All right. This is where all the applications have directories for storing their stuff. If you create an app, all right, um, and it has databases or files or whatever, it's writing to a directory in here. And notice that these directories belong to different users, all right? Because every app is a separate user. Okay, um, then you got backup for the backup stuff. You've got property. This is part of the property mechanism, which I will get back to you later, which I'll get back to you later, um, get back again. Uh, to talk about it later. Dalvik cache is the JIT cache for Dalvik. So when Dalvik takes an APK and um, creates a just-in-time optimized image for it, that's where it goes. You got system, which is stuff that, that actually is specific to the 
system services or the management of the system in general, including, sorry, the um, accounts which are created on the device, the list of packages which are installed, and so on and so forth. Okay? So whereas slash system starts off as you know, having the factory images which are running on the system, slash data usually starts as empty. And essentially, if you wipe slash data away, you kind of go back to factory mode, so to speak. So any questions about the layout of the file system or what it's doing? Make sense? OK, so it can, if you kind of go back to the slides here, yeah, I'm kind of like walking you through this stuff with actual words on the slides. It's a little bit less entertaining. <laughs> How does the architecture that we saw on Monday fit in all this? OK, so the kernel typically is not in the file system unless your bootloader is actually, uh, you know, grub or something like that. Uh, libraries, system lib, the HAL, system lib, HW, native daemons, and system bin, toolboxes in um, init and toolbox slash init, and then system bin, Dalvik is in system bin Dalvik, system services, and you kind of follow through with the rest of the stack like that, okay? So if you kind of go back through the two other sessions I gave you, uh, I give you an original one, uh, original diagram like this, which is the conceptual kind of walkthrough of where everything is. And then the second diagram I showed you is where the things in the sources. And this one shows it to you is in terms of at the runtime. All right. How does the build system influence this stuff? So remember those build underscore instructions that, tell you, that say how to build each type of mod build module? Well, whenever you use one of those, by default, the stuff you build goes in a separate directory. So if you use build executable, it'll go in system bin, a library will go in system lib, and an app will go in system app. That being said, there is, of course, in the build system a way to say, no, I, by the way, I want to go some, or somewhere else. Okay? And you can just tell that to the build system in your Android MK. Now, there are default rights and ownerships which are hard-coded inside a header file. There is no Etsy password for you to use. All right, where you can add users and check for users and stuff like that. Instead, let me show you the file. Really is fascinating, and it actually took me some some time to find it. Um, so, going to system core, <clears throat> uh, where's it again? Uh, include private Android file system config.h. All the file system magic kind of happens here. So let me show you. So here you have all the user IDs being defined. They're defined in a header file. Okay? Now, later on, he matches those IDs to actual strings. So when you type PS, okay, if I go to the device and I type PS and I get myself a bunch of strings here telling me who the, who the application belongs to, that's this file. All right? What else do we have in here? If I scroll down further, I got this Android Deers struct. What does that do? Well, it tells the system, or at least the tool that generates the file system images, what are the permissions for the various directories. And the one I really love is this one here, Android Files Struct. This one tells you the permissions for the files themselves. Okay? And most interestingly, it's got some wildcard ones. All right? That one's one of the things that really kind of made me lose a lot of time. I was adding stuff in slash lib. And my binaries wouldn't run. And I'm like, what's going on here? Why is not, why, is, you know, I've kind of created it with the executable bit. But the tool on the command line that generates the images does not care about the actual rights you have on your host. Okay? It goes in this struct and applies the rules that are here. The rest of the stuff that you have on your system, ah, regardless, not important. So, Yeah. I didn't know this worked like this. This is cool. It, it is, yes. The reason they did that is to work around file systems where they don't store permissions, like people trying to build an Android system on FAT. Oh, yeah. On what? FAT. Oh, on FAT. OK, sorry. I'm um, some. We need to read the thingy which creates images to find out. It's like it's really sort of hidden. Yeah. So if you, so for example, uh, remember I showed you earlier the content of my uh, emulator's file system? There was no slash bin, but somebody at Google's been playing around with slash bin because bin star is here, <laughs> right? Uh, what's not in here is lib star, right? So if you try to get a glibc based system merged with this file system, you're going to have to come in here and add lib star because if you don't, 
it will you know, give you some random error when you try to run the binary, something like you know, permission denied or you know, whatever, something that's not you know, related to this. OK? Yes? Sorry? After generating a executable file on force machine, yep. it uh, puts that particular binary into the target. Yes. Uh, and then, uh, it's something. Yep. So it, it's not making a default executable permissions. I need to, again, A, B, shell, C, small, C, seven, C, seven, and execute file. So right. Every time when you do that, is there any shortcut to make that as an executable for your post? So essentially what you're saying is when you use ADB to push a binary into system bin, um, it is 644 or something like that, or, and it's not 755. Um, I can't tell you exactly what's going on there, but I'm assuming that ADB just doesn't think that you want to make it executable, uh, and it just assumes that they're all 644 by default. Uh, and then you actually have to go in and do it by hand. So this is why you actually want to do this. You want to integrate in the build system and add your, your uh, binary straight in the build system and have it being copied there with these permissions properly set. And I'll show you later, um, hopefully I get, by the end of the session, I can actually show you a demo of what I'm doing uh, to actually change the Android's build file system to merge a glibc based file system and copy stuff over to the proper locations. And that may be helpful to what you're trying to do. All right? Otherwise, you know, we can catch up later. All right. So um, that's for your Android file system config.h. OK? Um, so just uh, know that this is there. OK, how does ADB work, right? ADB is apparently simple, right? I do ADB shell, and I get a shell, right? It's, it's that simple, is it not? Uh, it's actually a little bit more complicated, all right? So here's my host side, my target side. ADB daemon on the target side, connected to all sorts of stuff. On the host side, when you launch the command, uh, the ADB command on the command line, it starts an ADB server in the background. Okay? This ADB server is what is managing the connections to all the targets. And to actually run anything on remote, remotely, what your ADB command on the command line does is talk to this server, which then talks to the ADB daemon. And interestingly, the ADB server has a much richer command set than what the command line will tell you. Okay? So for example, if you want to grab a screenshot, you can do that with the DDMS tools in Eclipse. But you can't do that on the command line. All right? And the only difference is the command line doesn't actually expose that to you. All right? So there's nothing actually precluding you from adding a cell script that talks to ADB server directly if you wanted to. All righty, so what can it do? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, actually, if you go on the command line, you type ADB, right? If I go here and I type A, um, actually, let me shell out. So if I just type ADB, all right, it's got you know, an online help, um, you know, a rarity in, in Android. But you know, actually, this is pretty detailed. And it will explain to you uh, the various things it can do. Some of them are better documented than others, all right? So you can manage the device connections. You can uh, run remote commands like shelling, dumping the logs, you know, getting report, uh, bug reports. Port forwarding, very interesting. Okay? You can essentially just create a port forward between your host and the target and does that for you. And ADB actually um, is a key part of, AD, of, of the Dalvik debugging. So what happens is when ADB starts, uh, the ADB daemon starts, okay, it starts listening to port uh, in uh, a dev socket. And whenever a Dalvik application starts, it connects to this and advertises itself as being a Dalvik application. All right? And thereafter, if uh, you're trying on the host to talk to a Dalvik process, it actually goes through that to talk to your Dalvik process. So if I, if I go on the command line and I type, um, OK, so let me shell again. If I, uh, no, actually not. Sorry. ADB JDWP, this lists all the PIDs that are Dalvik processes. Okay? And then uh, you have a, a nice socket interface to talk to each one of these. Now, the interesting thing is if ADB hasn't started at boot time and you try to use it to debug stuff, it will only allow you to debug things that start after it starts. Because essentially, it wasn't listening to dev, socket, whatever. Okay? And when the process tried to connect, well, it wasn't there, so it's not advertising itself. All righty. 
Uh, file system commands like pushing, pulling, syncing file systems, installing applications, rebooting, and so on. And there's some PPP tunneling stuff, but honestly, it's very underdocumented. It's like one of the things that I've had the hardest of times finding out how ADB deals with it. Okay. The command line, all right? So once I shell into the device, what am I actually running? Like, for example, if I do ADB shell on my system here, ADB shell, what's going on here? What's this shell, all right? So in, up to Gingerbread, this is the NetBSD shell with very few modifications. Since 4.0, they're running this Mirror BSD shell, which is actually very interesting because it's got tab completion and you know, all the fancy stuff that you'd expect of a modern kind of uh, shell, to the exception of color coding. That, you know, I'm kind of colorblind, but <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, actually, I like uh, having color coding, because, you, know, uh, you know, just gazing at the screen, I know exactly what I'm looking at, right? If there's no color coding, it's a little bit more complicated. So a toolbox is a whole bunch of different commands, like traditional Linux commands, stuff for managing properties, services, and so on and so forth. And I'll show you the... Uh, uh, the, the property stuff in a second. So in the AOSP, it's in system core toolbox, in the actual file system, in system bin toolbox, and it provides this set of commands. Okay, this is very limited if you compare it to, to, to BusyBox, for example. All right, let me actually show that to you. Uh, uh, naturally not. Okay, so let's do this. Here, okay, here's BusyBox, here's Toolbox, all right? Your choice as to which one of these is more interesting, okay? So anyway, that's what Toolbox does. Um, they've added a few commands in, 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 um, in Jelly Bean, but you know, not much more. Then you also have Logcat, NFCFG, and DebuggerD. Let's just actually look at these for a second. If I type Logcat here, it will dump all the logger driver content that's currently on the system. This is really very crucial when you're doing a platform up, uh, you know, uh, bring up with Android because all the key messages for the system services are going to be dumped in this thing. Uh, NetCFG allows you to configure the uh, network interface and debugger D is this daemon that, that can kick in whenever an application dies to allow you to connect to it with GDB and actually start stepping through it through the thing. Yes, sir? Say that again. Oh, um, do we still have the kernel messages? Yes, you do. I mean, if you type D message, you still have it there. Yeah, that's still there. Oh, no, no, it's a separate buffer. So the kernel, uh, is it inside the log cat? No, it's not. It's a, it's a completely separate. Um, it's the same buffer that it was before. So you just do D message. And let me show you here. If I type. Um, okay, so I did log cat D M E S G. Here we go. Okay, so it's still there. All right. Yeah, yes, sir. One thing which could be good is uh, it's actually possible to hack init scripts and have the message sent to log cat. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you can huh. Correlate times. Interesting. Huh. So apparently there's a hack to actually. Uh, change the init scripts to dump the D message stuff into uh, uh, the log stuff. I'd be interested to see how that works if, if you have uh, some time to show it to me. Yes, sir? Uh, have you tried configuring the network Have I tried uh, configuring the network uh, on the command line with NetCFG? You have to use partly IF, IF config and NetCFG depending on what you're trying to do. So, for example, I, IF config will allow you to configure the network, whereas NetCFG will allow you to print the networking configuration. And if you actually dig in the courses, you'll actually see that they have like three different implementations of the DHCP client for some reason. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a part of the stack that's really inconsistent and not actually well designed, at least for my opinion. Um, Correct. Correct. There's a lot of the network. A lot of the networking stuff is is not, at least from my perspective, it does it doesn't seem intuitive, or the tools are kind of really, really, really very, very, very basic. 
All right, how does the init process work? Okay, so the init process started by the kernel, all right, takes some configuration files, and then um, displays a boot logo if necessary, starts a bunch of daemons, and then essentially manages a bunch of properties. There's two things which are involved in the properties. There's the dev socket property service, which allows applications to actually talk to init and ask it to set the values of properties. And there's a global properties workspace, which is as dev underscore underscore properties underscore underscore, uh, which allows uh, applications to read the properties. The latter is not visible. If you go to ls, do an ls and slash dev, it's not there. And it's a little bit of a long explanation, but let's just say um, they create the file, the, they actually, they create the file, they memory map it, then they actually delete it. And so it's memory mapped so they can continue using it and then pass it on to the child processes and so on. We can talk about that later if you want. Anyway, the most important thing here is it gets configuration files, starts a whole bunch of native daemons. Okay, what are the config files? Slash init rc and slash init board name rc. It's got two types of entries, actions and services. Um, the, uh, the actions are um, start, uh, essentially the, uh, the lines that start with the on keyword. 10 minutes, Jesus. All righty, uh, services start with the service keyword. Let's see how we can do this in 10 minutes. All righty, um, so let me do a quick, 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 really quick intro to this file. So if I go to root dear init rc, all right, here's an on trigger, a bunch of commands. And if I scroll down, I have um, service definitions with the name of the service as it is known in this file and the actual command to run. The lines that follow are actually parameters on how to manage that service. The word service here is completely misleading because it has nothing to do with system services nor services which are part of applications. This is an init service, okay? Completely independent. Alrighty, uh, global properties. If you go to the command line and you type, if you type um, get prop, this will list the properties which are currently maintained by uh, init. You can change those and so on. There's a few, uh, a lot of these properties are actually um, key configurations, uh, like for example, the networking stuff is, is in there some, somewhat, uh, and so on and so forth. They have the name uh, space of, you know, like name dot other name dot other name dot other name, where you, know, you start with category, subcategory, and you kind of nail down. It kind of is a registry, so to speak, like the Windows registry, but on the command line. So you have read-only variables, variables that are written to the file system, special variables, which aren't really variables, but actually commands to init. So when you do ctl.start and you give it a variable, it actually start, tries to start that service. Then you get net change, which are the previous values of the networking configuration if you ever change the config. Sorry, I'm going very faster because we got 10 minutes. There are files that contain default properties, all right, that come, so to speak, from factory. So for example, if you go to system, there's a build.prop. These are the default properties which are created at build time, like the um, compile signature and all that kind of stuff. This is what you, some, some of these values you see when you go to the about the phone thing and the menus and the actual phone. And there's other parts, uh, other files involved with this. And there's also code that can uh, provide default values if it can't file the pro pro property uh, as part of the property. So for example, this code here says, if I can't find this Dalvik VM heap size, we'll take 16M as being the default, all right? Um, the really complex thing here is that there's no central dictionary of all these variables and you can create them at whim, so this is hard to follow sometimes. U of NT, that's the hot plug mechanism used by Android. <clears throat> Again, started by init. Um, this has a bunch of configuration files. It gets U events from the kernel, uh, which will generate a creation of entries in slash dev. The format of this thing, as I showed you earlier, entry, rights, user, uh, owner, and then uh, group. Boot logo, let's say you want to actually change the boot logo. Uh, you can just create a file, all right? Let's say it's called Acme um, logo PNG. I can just use the convert thing to take to generate a acme logo.raw and then take that file and put it out in an RLE file. And as soon as I have that, essentially I can boot with my own logo. Let me show you that. So if I go to here and I copy uh, boot logo, no, boot animations, nope, Android boot logo. There we go, init.rle. 
put that in out, target product generic uh, into root, and then rm out target product generic uh, ramdisk.img make hyphen j8. Okay, um, close this guy off. So when this finishes building and I start the emulator again, it will show me my boot logo instead of the A on DL or ID letters that it showed the first time I started this. Is there any size constraint? Sorry? Size constraint. Size constraint. Not that I know of, but it, I mean, you just might have to make sure that you got the right size of the screen that you're booting from. Um, alrighty. Okay. So just to give you an idea here, just to focus here a second on Bionic. Bionic is a C library. You'll find it in system lib and it's got all these components inside of it. If you want to build tiny Android, what the heck's that? Well, it's the stack without most of it, but Bionic in it and Toolbox. Okay, this is useful for board bring up. Five minutes, eh? All right, awesome. Um, if you're doing board bring up, this is, this is something you want to look at. Okay, it's really, really basic. It doesn't have any of the Java stuff, but it gives you a shell and you can start doing stuff on the device. Next. Let's say I want to bring glibc-based stuff into my stack. All right, this starts to get interesting. Uh, why do I want to do that? Uh, you can read the slides, all right? But let me show you how to do it. <laughs> so you can actually uh, change the build system to tell it to copy uh, a root file system of yours into its bin and lib or whatever. Cop just merge the two file systems, okay? And let me show you how to do that. So um, what I did as a hack, um, Two weeks ago when I was at the Embedded Linux conference, I sat down with the uh, Free Electrons guys and we were able to get build root integrated in the USP in like five minutes, you know, literally, so to speak. So let me show you this. Um, all right, wrong shell, okay. Oh, by the way, here, um, the boot lo here's the logo I was telling you about, all right. All righty. Oh, come on. You can actually pass that build name on the lunge command and it'll auto select it. I'm sorry, say that again? When you type lunge, if you just put, put the target in. Yeah, 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 yes. Yes, absolutely. Just for people's uh, Sure. Um, I mean, when you, I'm typing lunch and I'm like typing enter, 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 I could actually say lunch and then generic ENG and it will do the same thing. Okay, so here's a, um, okay, um, actually, what am I doing wrong? Uh, all right, yes, I'm actually at the right location, sorry. Okay, so I have a build root directory. It's got an extracted build root, which I kind of uh, compiled, but the most interesting part here is the MK. Here's the Android MK I added. Now, if you look at this MK, it's still got the local include, blah, 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 blah. And here, interestingly, the upper, uh, the kind of key thing that's happening here is they all pre-built plus equals build root, root FS. And what is that doing? Build root, root FS is making sure target root out is, ex exists, and then it actually extracts the image that was generated by build root into that target root out. Okay? That's kind of like the first step to make sure the build system merges your root directories. The second step is to make sure the, the Android file system config.h does the right job. So if I go to system core, um, sorry, include private Android file system config.h, I have added libstar, okay, to make sure it's executable. That's part of it. There are two other parts. So if I go to uh, root deer, I modified init rc to make sure that slash bin is the first item in the path. And the last part, uh, over here, I modified the sources of ADB so that when you do ADB shell, I am actually going to use bin sh, not system bin sh. Okay, and as a result, so here's the emulator that started with BusyBox. If I do, uh, sorry. Uh, 
lo and behold, we've got color-coded LS. <laughs> All right, so this can be uh, interesting for a number of reasons, okay? Namely, if you have legacy code that you want to run side by side with the AOSP, you can do just that, all right? And then have them talk through sockets back and forth. And I have a bunch of customers doing this because they've invested, you know, so many years writing stuff that runs on Linux. They don't want to port it over Android. It's a lot of trouble or whatever. They just get the stacks running by, right by, side by side like this. Yes, sir? And we have another test code running on Bash. Yep. So you have a lot of uh, test code running on Bash. Is this an easier way of doing it? Absolutely. You can just you know, take Bash, compile it, make, put it in the file system, and all your scripts exactly as they were before. But there is no Bash APK. Uh, there's no Bash APK. OK, just to, um, so essentially, um, the APK stuff is for app developers. But on the command line, uh, you can still run commands uh, in you know, system bin and stuff like that. So you can essentially take the um, Bash binary compile it and have it merge into the file system like I did over here. One thing you may want to look at is ADB Sync as a development tool. A lot of people don't use it a lot, but I don't know if you've used it. Yes, ADB Sync will allow you to essentially synchronize the um, host's file system with the Tiger's root file system. I bring it up as if you're doing testing and you're doing active development, if you integrate whatever you have into the, into the Android build system natively, and you do ADB Sync, it'll actually synchronize all your executables. It'll save you a lot of time. I don't know how well ADB Sync works with the, or the, uh, with your hack. It does make a difference. My hack doesn't make a difference to ADB Sync. Does it work? Just work? It, it should just work. I mean, there's no difference. I mean, the, the existing binary is still there. I mean, if I go back to my shell here, I can still, so for example, if I type PS, Right? Um, it, see, it shows numbers for the, for the user IDs because it doesn't know how to match these users to actual real users. But the other PS is still there. So system, uh, I'm sorry, system uh, bin PS, it's still there. Yeah. Right? So all the other stuff is still running. No. All right, we're going to get one more question. Go ahead. One thing to watch out for when you're using this technology for testing stuff is that if, uh, depending on what you are testing, you will not be getting the results you are expecting. For example, if you are running a test that's supposed to test the C library, and you do it in a GLMC-based environment, you are not actually testing the version of Bionic you build. So True. when using this technology for testing, just make sure it matches what you want to test. All right, awesome. We did it again in one hour. Dude, we should be doing this often because, <laughs> you know, time together, this actually works out. Thank you very much, and I'll still be around until tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>